Hi, I'm Denise Dryden doing uh, a surprise interview. Actually, this isn't my norm. Um, I'm I'm reaching out and talking with a really amazing woman, a colleague, a friend, a uh, client, and we have Olivia, <laughs> Olivia McCutcheon and I have been talking about this interview for uh, about what, a week now, week and a half. And um, I'll give you a chance to say hi, and then we're just going to dive in here. So do you want to do a brief introduction of yourself or would you want me to do that? What works best for you, Liv? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, like you said, I'm I'm a, a, a client of yours and I have and everything is just starting to, you know, just grow and expand since that first session that we took. Um, and but I've I'm also learning more about myself as I reach out to those who I really connect with. So I'm learning that I'm a researcher as well. I'm a historian. I'm a teacher. I'm an observer. And I really love that we've had the opportunity to come together and, and talk about this and um, share our ideas and our um, readings and then going back and having another look and re-examining it. So it's been really, really fun. Um, yeah, and when you follow your um, what lights you up, you just you start to understand a little bit more about who you are at the core. <laughs> Makes sense. And and during this last two weeks, while the solar flares and I don't know this astrology, it seems like everything's just sort of shut us down. I'm in this quiet researching mode, and I've been just texting and talking with women in particular all over the world. And I love that you and I have this connection from from Montana to Australia, right? And that we can reach out. So so before we get really uh, going, I, I also want to mention that you have two incredibly energetic kids, which is you know what makes my world work, is when we have children that are insightful, intuitive, galactic, they're they're picking up on pieces and and that's part of what is also amazing is how you parent two children that are really energetically unique and different and highly skilled. So I just want to make sure that we put that on there. Now this interview, this interview. Okay. So this was handed to me by Tara, who is a girlfriend of mine and, and very rarely do, do I have interviews going back and forth, but especially it's something called the diary of a CEO. I'm not a business oriented, um, a podcast listener. And this is with, uh, Mo Gadot, um, and, you know, he's a former uh, Microsoft and now Google X. Um, I think he's retired from that now. So I'm going to share the screen just for a second so that we can um, see the interview that we're talking about. OK, so this is Stephen Bartlett interviewing Mo Gadot, um, on what exactly. Um, let me see. Now I'm going to stop sharing because I really don't want to have that up the whole time. But you can go back and look at it. Um, and I will also have the link down underneath so that you can listen to it to your um, yourself. So, you know, uh, true confessions, I'm, I'm a triple water. So I'm, I'm emotional. And when I hear things, I start to lean in and go like, Oh, I really like this. And so the things that, that kind of caught me, um, from this interview were the parts where he talked about his son and how his son to me felt like this beautiful rainbow or this energetic child or this little Buddha who was given to him to teach him about happiness, about love, about the, 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 how to, how to use this brilliant mind that this man has that has been going into coding and, 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 and AI and, and all of the tech leadership on our, on our planet. So there was this, this, this interest in the sun. The second thing was that he brought up that AI is growing and that we have this opportunity, responsibility, gift to shape the way AI goes with our own algorithms. And if we go for peace and love and harmony, then we can start to teach AI to go that way. And I was like, it's the first time I felt like there's, I have a deeper understanding. And Tara and I've talked about this, that, that, oh man, AI, I take it out of the scary category, right? And then mm -hmm. the third thing was at the very end, when they asked him, what is his greatest failure? He said that he has failed to empower his feminine side. And I'm like, oh, a man who actually says, I didn't ever get that the feminine side of, of, of my energy system was, was valuable, you know? And so I'm like, Liv, you gotta listen to this. So I send it over to you, right? <laughs> and, 
and I'm and I and I also had my doubts because I don't like the format. It's it's two men talking, two men with a lot of wealth talking, and you know I'm not here to dump on the interview. It just wasn't my cup of tea, right? <laughs> and there were some pieces that I liked and some pieces that I was kind of like, hmm, I'm not so sure about. So when I handed it to you, tell me what your experience was when you got it and and what you went through from there because it was priceless. <laughs> <laughs> well. I'm I'm always interested in what gets handed to me from you because that's how I discovered Tara. I, I have to really stop myself from calling her Tara because that's how we would <laughs> say it in Australia. But Tara um, and her um, podcast, uh, A Mother's Intuition, has just been like I I, I still like I. It, my memories of that are synonymous with being in the garden and having these aha moments while I'm listening and tuning in. So I'm always interested in the things that you send me. And then pretty much the um, the red flags went up as soon as I saw the title, that picture that you put up just before, red flag, <laughs> red flag. Um, we're always... So there are like there were there are some themes that really jumped out at me initially that made that made me step into skepticism. And that was the word expert, the expert on happiness. Because we always have to listen to the experts. You know, that's what we're being guided to do. And um he was the happiness expert who made 51 million people happy. I'm like, but we understand through the soul journey that there is there isn't anyone else outside of us that can make us happy. So exactly how did he do that? How does he quantify 51 million people being happy? Are they happy all at the same time? Is happiness not transient anymore? Because I thought the feeling of happiness was kind of in flow here. <laughs> so, And I was interested, like, how did he do that? Um And then when I found out it was through an app on the phone that was created through AI, I was like, okay, mm, um, wonder where this is going to (laughs) go. But I did also see where, um, where you had come into connection with him because he, he did, he does pull you in with the the story of Ali, his son. And I did have some tears. Um, I did because it's a really beautiful story. And, um, but, you know, his his way of like putting happiness into a, a formula, like I was always thinking, like I was listening the first time around going, okay, that's cute. Like, yeah. Um, but I also had thought, I might go into this now, um, that I'd heard this before I was sure that I had heard this before and I didn't um find it the first time around but the second time around um I looked at his happiness flow chart again so I've written it down um you want to go into this right now yeah go for it yeah all right um so his happiness flow chart runs is it true you know this thought that you have is it true next step can I do something about it if so go and do it Um, And then if not, can I accept it and start to do something despite or because of its presence? So it's basically just a yes, no, yes, no flow chart through how we find happiness. Um, And I found (laughs) the thing that it reminded me of. It's the prayer for serenity, which is attributed to Reinhold Niebuhr, a Lutheran theologian, a theologian, sorry, And everyone's probably seen this on a banner somewhere. Um, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And as I wrote those two, yeah. (laughs) I would have never put those two together and laid them on a flow chart and a serenity prayer. Wow. Okay. But the thing is, when you write them next to each other, um, Mo's happiness flow chart is the inversion of the prayer. So it ends with acceptance and it starts with what um, Reinhold, uh, I don't know how to say, Nyber, <laughs> hopefully saying that right. He, say yeah. he ends with the concept of wisdom. And mm. Mo starts up here, assuming that you've already got it. And that we're, the, at the end goal is to accept that which is going on. Wow. Mm. So... 
I mean, that's what's really subtle. This, your brain is picking up all of these markers that are saying, I've heard this before, or uh, where is this coming from? What do I do with this? I, you're having reactions to it while you're listening. Mm. Mm. And I suppose I should have in the introduction said that um, my background is in art history and theory. So I and I have a master's in arts administration. So I've literally been trained on how to um, critique texts, whether they're visual, written, audi audible, whatever. So I, I have this um, background in being able to assess, bring thoughts together and, you know, pull things from everywhere to to bring meaning to something so that's that's my training which is kind of really fun <laughs> now I when we know to... about you. I've learned this since we started this interview so you know I knew that you had art history but I didn't realize exactly how you use that mm. and how you applied it to this right now so you have this reaction and then you tell me about what your reaction is and then tell me what you did next because that's the part which is you know i'm smart i figured this out i i i am i'm i'm i have some talking points and we're going to go further into the talking points but i want to first go to the response that you had when you sent me an email and i and you weren't sure and i didn't respond for a couple of days because it was in the middle of something else i was babysitting my granddaughter <laughs> so tell me what the process was like for you um, so I went through, I, I wasn't taking any notes at that point. I went through the whole thing. I had, as I, as it went on more and more, I was like, okay, I'm feeling anger, frustration, because <laughs> I'm hearing a lot of gaslighting in it, um, towards the audience. Um, and um, I think the thing, uh, thing that really irritated me was that this guy had given two hours to um, the interviewer and they were not on the same level. So I felt like the, the interviewer was being played, I think I said, like a violin. Um, and, and all of it just made me kind of just go, you know. <laughs> and then um, I doubted that initial response because because I went hang on Denise has sent me this I, I'm, I'm got to be missing something here like is this my own trauma and my own biases and my own um, perspectives that I that I have built up that are layering this emotional response from me um, and so then I've written out to you and just said look can you I just you know um just wanted to check why the, <laughs> you wanted to send this to instead of just going blah this is what I think um it was a it was a very like kind of tiptoe in and go just wanted to touch base and understand this a little bit more like why did you feel that you wanted me to to watch this and where are your thoughts on this because mm, I'm I'm going to make a big assumption that mine are different <laughs> well and, 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 then, and what I liked about that is that it whether it was me or the external, there was this like, fro you froze mm. and you started to go, well, what if I didn't, what if I'm off? What if I didn't get that right? What if there's, there, there's a reason why Denise sent it that I didn't get. And, and, and I think that that's the most beautiful part of the feminine process is to go like uh, self-reflection, like, oh, I may be on a different vibration here and I'm not sure what that is. Mm. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is that, you know, you and I've talked a lot about Chiron and mm. where our wounds are and, 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 and it just like the, the beauty of how it hits your pinged on your Chiron wound. And then the email that you sent me and it pinged on mine. So if we were go to, if we were go to, to the, the first house Chiron wound, which is, you know, like it, yours and many, many, <laughs> if you have a first house Chiron room, <laughs> I would describe that as like this, what happens when people don't, when I watch their faces or their acceptance and they don't accept what I just said from the external or they frown or they look away or they don't respond. And I feel rejected. 
Mm. because my voice can't be heard by the one person as opposed to the 400 people that liked it. And the one person who I thought should, would, could, mom, dad, Denise, whatever role we want to put in it, right? Didn't respond. And then it's like, ouch, that hurts. Mm. That makes sense? Yes. And I think something I didn't, um, just listening to you say that too, one thing I didn't, I I edited out of my email too, was that, um, you know, that it, I did go through a fear process in that if I say what I'm thinking and Denise does not agree with me, do I then lose another mentor in my life? Is that another person who I can bounce ideas off that goes poof, gone because we don't, sorry, <laughs> it's um, because we, we don't share that very core belief or we, we now have this rupture where you know, I'm over here with this thought form and you're over here with that thought form and how do we merge that together? And, um, but I think that's what we're doing a lot with the the coaching work as well. You quite often say both and. So, um, so I decided not to put that in the email because I was like, it, it, it's, it's going to be okay. I know it's going to be okay, but mm, the last couple of years have not been a very easy place. <laughs> to to be in um, with a first house Chiron (laughs) Chiron period because Chiron has been in Aries which is a first house sign which means it's always going to go straight to our to the center of us and go like how are you really doing because Mm. it's all about you right so there's the tip into the wound and then there's really actually the spring back into no I I still need to send this and Mm. so that's where we go into using our voice in, in trusting the process. So you send me an email about, you know, hey, I'm tracking these, I'm tracking how many times is mentioning something. I'm looking at thought forms. I'm looking at this and that. And I go, oh no, I totally missed that. Oh, how did I send that to somebody and not even like really like explore it? And, and then I go into my Chiron <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious because what what I start doing is going like every intuitive part of me that was interested in reading this and 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 reacting to this interview. What if it was wrong? Mm. And what if I can't trust the way that I feel about things because mm. it misled me? And and then then you know realizing that I'm I'm tipped all the way over in my response to you. And then I, I emailed Tara and Tara's like, now nah, I disagree with you. I don't agree with this at all. And I was like, oh no, now I've done this one too. <laughs> and, and, and just the process of having attachment to this intuitive feeling of, I like it and there's something there. And I think it's worth exploring too. What if I just blew it way out of proportion and sent it to people that it doesn't even matter. So I go into my wound and then I have to come back up and say, well, wait a minute, what do you really know about thought forms? And, and Liv really did a beautiful job explaining thought forms. And so like, like I did my bone bounce back and spring up over this idea that two men, you know, are talking about happiness, parenting, AI and the feminine energy, and we're both having our own reactions to it. And we're still having reactions to it that are Mm. our real Chiron wound reactions. Mm. And so the springing back up then, you know, was you're spot on Liv, you know, what you're seeing as far as thought forms makes sense to me. And do you want to talk about this on an interview or on a, on a, a zoom recording? Because I think this process has value to other people to watch how, you know, what happens when we process things? What happens when we share something with someone else? What happens when we don't get the feedback back that we thought we were going to get? And then how do we stand strong, you know, in our feminine energy and say, I have my own intuitive take on this and I can agree to disagree. And I can believe that it's both. And, and it can, it can serve all of us because it has served this process. Mm. So that to me was, was the, was the beauty of, of this experience in realizing that it was fun to watch you go into, into yours. And then, then it was not so fun for me to realize that I'd been in mine as well. And that it was human. 
Mm-hmm. It was self-reflective to be able to say, this is where I went and this is where I came back, which is what happens when my gut says something doesn't line up here, even though it's good information. Mm-hmm. So can we go through the talking points that we talked, that we shared and I printed them off and left them on, oh, they're there, they're right over here, <laughs> put them someplace <laughs> so I wouldn't forget, which is what happens when we're looking, and I want to start first with thought forms. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what is a thought form and what, what would you describe it as? And how did you, how did you pick it up? How did it catch your attention and how did you start um, tracking it? Um, <clears throat> so how did I, how did I come to the conclusion that this was about thought forms? Yeah. Like wh- how did you come up with the concept that that's what this was about? I'm trying to pinpoint where it was. Um, I think it was in the subtle inversions because I, like I've, like I've been saying to you, I listen to lots of different perspectives. So I realized um, through this process that I am a, I am a, a, a both and kind of person because I'm listening to um, historians um, over here and I'm listening to channelers over here and under da, 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 da. So I will take in everything Um and not be a, I, I don't agree with that. I'm like, oh, that, I love, I love picking up your terminology. That's interesting. That's interesting. That's happening over there. And now that's happening. That's interesting. Um, and it was the, it was the subtle inversions that were, that I was picking up on um, in his, in his interview that really kind of guided me to this, um, to this point of understanding that we're, and, you know, one of my first theme points was guided and manipulative, not versus, not or, just guided and manipulative. Um, so it really kind of drove me to then go exploring, like, why why does he need to guide our thought forms in this way? Why, why did he? Oh, so this was a big one. Um, because if you look at putting a text together, like an es- like how you're going to construct your essay, that's so how I approach reading the interview. Um, and I remember um, when, in 2020 listening to an interview with David Icke. Now, this isn't to talk about David Icke and who he is and what he represents. But for me, listening to this interview, I he he was talking about scary stuff. <laughs> this is like the, you know, this is the point to get your shit scared sort of thing for three quarters of the interview and the last quarter was hope and it was a story about you know recognizing what is happening in the world and facing up to hard truths which are scary but then left with you know the last half an hour or so of this message of hope and understanding who we are which then you know, from there, listening to that interview, I exploded off into a hundred different questions. Like, what does he mean by this? How do I know? Da, 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 da. And so I started exploring. And Mose is the opposite. He has spent three quarters of this interview pulling you in with the heart story and pulling you in with the emotions and drawing you in and um, and then leaves in leaves with a fear-based story. So fear and love is always the the you know, the guiding um, thing, like, you know, how is this making me feel? Am I, am I, you know, am I in love or am I in fear? That's pretty much what it comes down to. And I thought that was really interesting that he started off with love and he took this love story all the way through and then he ended in fear. Oh, and by the way, the solution is really simple. You just got to like show up on Instagram. I'm like, Huh. Okay. So that was like the really big ping for me is like, why has he talked about happiness? And now he's talking about the pandemic of AI. And why do you leave this much (laughs) at the end to discuss it? Because there was so much that he didn't touch on, Mm -hmm. which he could have touched on because if there's anything he should be an expert in, it's about understanding artificial intelligence. Um, He is an expert in that he, he, that wasn't what he overtly was going to talk about in the interview it was where that where he was going to leave us with that yeah 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 um, yeah. Mm-hmm. um do you know what 
I don't know if I can actually pinpoint where it was, but it was in another interview that I listened to straight after it. So I listened to the one that you sent me and then there was one on my back burner that I really wanted to listen to, um, which was Pam Gregory and Heather Ensworth in conversation. And they started to talk about uh, thought forms. Now, Pam's been talking about thought forms and how to stay in love and um, how that forms our reality and so on. And so I think once that final ping kind of went in, I then went back to his interview, listened to the whole thing all over again, took pages of notes with this idea of like, where is he driving the thought forms? Where is he, where is he taking us into, into these sorts of things? Um, Brilliant. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then I've, I actually did find out with more research that this um, whole idea of, you know, um, the, the most happiness for the most people is not a new concept either. Um, have you heard of um, Jeremy Bentham? I haven't, but feel free to, to, to tell me what you learned. Mm, so this was um, listening to a read aloud by Alison McDowell, who's, who I love because she's another wonderful wise woman and she's also has a background in art history and she's coming from she's coming at all of this from the education space and she is reading another text and goes oh yeah you know that sounds this this thing in here sounds like you know the most happiness for the most people which is the Bentham imperative basically and I went what's the Bentham imperative (laughs) (laughs) He's the father of utilitarianism, which is a moral theory that argues that actions should be judged right or wrong um, to the extent they increase or decrease human well-being or utility. And I mean, as soon as I hear, I see the words judged right or wrong, I'm like, oh, so basically this guy wants to insert man into the role of the creator, like the creator doesn't, and like literally in the next paragraph, he is a um self-professed atheist I'm like well that makes sense you know (laughs) um but the quote that I pulled out was ethics at large may be defined as the art of directing men's actions to the production of the greatest possible quantity of happiness so the moral agent will thus perform the action that maximizes happiness and pleasure for everyone involved um, which also sounds a little bit like, um, you know, the the very common phrase we hear a lot, uh, you will own nothing and be happy, perhaps. You so know, happiness the, and agents. The way that your mind and the way that you put together the pieces around this interview uh, is brilliant because it's what it's detecting is this is two concepts. One is that we know that form follows thought. Mm -hmm. So what we bring into our head, what we hear, what we see, what we create in our head, whether, however we do that turns into our observation and what we start to pick out and notice and bring into form in front of us. Mm -hmm. However, the process of manifesting that into form needs the emotions to line up with that as well. And so it's thought and emotions targeted together in, and then that creates a manifestation. And it didn't think about this until I heard this last piece that you just um, talked about um, on happiness, which is happiness is an emotion that can be brought up and then like a funnel or a fire hose turn towards the different things. It's still an emotion. It's still energy. It still has fire and emotion, fire and water, you know, force and, and form together aligned with the, the constriction or the, or the direction of the mind. And so I'm not thinking that there's anything nefarious here. It's just more like, wow, they, there are so many people who are really good at understanding all of the way that these energy forms can be harnessed and used mm. for good or mm. evil, always our choice, right? Or for, for the, in the direction that we want to go and that there are, it would be naive of us to think that anyone who's leading the world in communication, technology, digital um, growth doesn't have backgrounds in how all of this works 
because oh, yeah. that's part of the big secret is that, or the big, the, the big silent, you know, so like, we're not going to talk about that is, is that all of this is known to those, those in charge and not known to those who are following. So, mm-hmm. for, you know, thought forms, I like the way you're listening to an interview that I'm having, you know, emotional responses to, right. You know, I'm like, wow. And I'm floating around on it and sort of trying to harness it and figure out how I really feel about this. And you're going ping, 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 which when I went back and listened to it after you brought that up, I was like, I missed all of that. I didn't even think about thought forms, which I think puts me in the category of that person who, if my heart is awakened and I'm in it, I'm not going to be as discerning as I could. And then, then I'm thinking, how do I make sure that my heart and my brain, my heart and my mind are working together because together we're going to, we're going to form the construct of what it is because our water, our heart, our emotions are, what's the way that I would, um, they define, they, they put sort of a Mm -hmm. I I wrote it down earlier today and I thought it was really interesting. They, they understand the structure or pattern of behavior. Water is the pattern of behavior. Fire Mm -hmm. is the force that goes behind it. And then the mind, and this came out of Pamela Eakins, the spirit of tarot. So we have fire, which is the source of strength, which pushes towards something. And then it comes to water and then water puts the structure of how it's going to behave. And then the mind draws the conclusions Mm. or puts the construct on it. Mm. And so then these three really, and then they come into four, which is embodiment and manifestation. So some are really good at thought form. Some are really good at behavior. Like, you know, to me, I'm, I'm watching the behavioral patterns and I love watching the strength, like who's got the, who's got the willpower to say their own voice and who shirks back and in parent coaching and energy coaching. Those are the two things I pay attention to. I have not been trained as well as you have to pay attention to the mental constructs when they set in and they start to direct it like a Mm. fire goes this way. Mm. No, we want to go this way. No, we want it to go this way. Yeah. And just as you're saying that, I've gone, oh, ping too, because I've been like, I've been learning about astrology and I find my chart quite fascinating because all I've known up until I started like researching more is um, that, you know, I'm a Cancerian and I'm a water sign, so I must be all about emotions. But when you look at my chart in its totality, it's mostly fire and air. So and also, as you were thinking, I was thinking about how do I bring up the reaction that I had when he was um, when he was talking about Ali, and it was at a very pivotal emotional point, and there was a pause, you know, because I've just got to, I've got to, you know, I'm going to hold back the tears before I move forward. That I've learned is my cue to go, whoa, where am I? where where am I like when because that will always be the tear jerking moment when they've and that's actually not that hard to um you know it doesn't take a skilled actor to be able to like put that that pause in for the effect of opening your heart so that's always my like whoa where am I at in this and am I dream am I being drawn in um to somewhere like that 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 just feels like now I've learned that that's like an energetic field practice going whoa 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 whoa. um can I can I still listen and take this in but not essentially just pour my heart out into it too and again that might not resonate for most people but I think that yeah just putting that piece together of like the the fire and the air that might be like a little defense mechanism that I have put together because I have just, you know, spilled out in the past, I suppose. Um, And that might sound like the tournament because I I went back to read the four agreements after one of the coaching sessions with you. And it was so funny. I was listening to this interview on a train 
to go away for a weekend to visit a girlfriend and I took one book with me because I wanted to pack lightly. Four agreements. Oh, the fifth agreement. Yes. Fifth agreement. And I've listened to the interview and I've gone, okay, I'm going to switch to my book. I wonder what the fifth agreement is. Be skeptical, but learn to listen. Don't believe yourself or anybody else. Use the power of doubt to question everything you hear. Is it really the truth? Listen to the intent behind words and you will understand the real message. And I think that's what that is, is like, can I, can I listen to the words? Can I really listen to the space in between them? And can I come to understand their, what they really mean? And it might just be what they really mean for me. Yeah. Because we are the receiver as well. Like there's, I suppose, in any form of communication, there's the deliverer and then there's the receiver. And it's just like art. Like one picture will paint completely different responses for, for other people. And people observing or or appreciating the art may see something that the artist didn't even didn't even see and didn't even know when they were doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I love this because what we're really talking about is understanding the human energy field and how it can be manipulated, how it can be guided, how it can be opened, how it can be shut down. Um, based on on what aligns and what doesn't and and to know ourselves enough to know is that shut down out of fear or past triggering or is there something there and until we know ourselves well enough to know why we did that that response excuse me if we then until we know ourselves enough to be able to go I know what mine is but there was something else there and to trust that then we are navigating through truth. And, and I'm, you know, I'm still going to say at the end of all of it, I think it was both. And there were some incredible parts of the interview that felt heart that really got to my heart. And I, and I loved the work that I was hearing. And I was also realizing it's, it's both. And, and whoa, listening to somebody who's that um, professional that well um, honed in the higher echelons of of algorithms and whatnot, I knew that there was there was a need for caution. Mm. And so it was both my heart was open and there was caution there. And I'm still and that's and I don't know that we'll ever know the answer in it. That really isn't the point. And he looks like a very nice man and was it was a it was a lovely interview and it was a hard interview, both. Both and mm. Mm. me. What would, so as we are bringing this sort of to a close, because we want to be sensitive that you and I don't want to be talk for two hours either, right? (laughs) We could. (laughs) But we could do this again and again and again and again, because this is fun. I like working Mm. like this with you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's not, and like I said, I I had um, brought in my themes to explore. And like I said to you, like I started writing this versus that, this versus that. And then I immediately started scribbling it out and going, no, and, and like there, and I think that's what it is. He's not, he's not um, spilling untruths. Like what he is talking about is truth. It's just how, like, we need to be discerning how we're going to funnel and interpret that um thought form that has now been presented to us like um one thing that came to to me as I was like putting it all together was you know he was talking about um radical acceptance so his term was radical acceptance we often hear this in the spiritual community as surrendering but is it surrendering to the energies or is it surrendering to the events that are happening around us, like the external? Like, are we surrendering to what is happening around and within us because there is no difference? Or are we surrendering to that which is outside of us and affecting us and affecting our emotions? And so it's just going to be how you read that and how you choose to move forward. There, It's not a wrong concept at all. Um, and it it absolutely touches on the truth. And I thought one thing I did want to mention too is that when I started 
looking up Jeremy Bentham, it, it sparked a really nice conversation with my husband over lunch. Um, and he has, he's completely different to me. We're very, very opposite in terms of what we're interested in. And so um, when I started talking about utilitarianism and that sort of thing, and I'm like, what do you think about this? And he's like, well, utility is a, it's like, it's economics 101. Mm -hmm. And I was like, tell me more. <laughs> I don't know anything about <laughs> economics. Okay. And, and so we looked it up and it's like utility is an economic theory that measures the value, the happiness or satisfaction that someone gets from consuming a product or service. And so then I have written down, do we want to serve a function or a purpose? And I think that's what I really gained from that interview is like, do I want to serve a function or a purpose? What am I here to do? And it's really brought up all these incredible conversations and explorations in my own mind about where are we going with this death of the ego thing and what is this spiritual ascension and when you were talking about the water like I started thinking about plasma and it was just and again so it's the same result as the David Icke interview all of a sudden I've got whew, like all these other questions and you know explorations that I, I need to go out on this quest now to pull them all together so it, it the same result <laughs> Fabulous, isn't it? Uh, you know, all through December and January, I, I have I have work with my clients, and on the on the personal sort of energetic side, I've been like stalling out. Like, and part of it's the fact that I live in Montana, and there's still a lot of snow on the ground, right? And it's heavy winter. And the other part was that it, it wasn't because I like to play in the snow, and I love to be outside in it. And it was energetically, I was stuck. I didn't know where to go. And this process, thank you, Tara, of having this interview come across, watching how Mo and Stephen, you know, sort of brought things to the surface. And then my reaction and, and, and it has sparked so much research mm. into everything that I'm doing at this point that has put an entirely different um, uh, opening of where to go and what to explore. So I'm really thankful that that it came across and that I, that I could explore all of the reactions, information, um, you know, um, validations, questions, everything that came about from it. So mm -hmm. it was very much of a spark of energy for me. It sounds like yeah. this is you. Yeah, absolutely. And the timing is really interesting too, with the, the March equinox approaching soon awesome. too, which is just, that's been quite mind blowing as well. It's just that, these these layers start to become apparent to us when we're ready to dive in and when you know when the energies are kind of set and prepped for this I'm just thinking if this had landed in my lap three years ago I would have just been like I'm out I'm out I don't want to <laughs> this is too much it's not a new interview either this is something that's been around for a while and yet you know it's sort of going <laughs> around and 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 activating thank goodness it's activating yeah. You know, and that's, you know, to me, that's both and energy is energy. And when there's an activation, it's like, follow it. And to me, that's, that's where the function or the, the, the process is that am I reacting to the external or am I paying attention to my own inner reactions and getting to know them so that at any given time, when something happens, I'm not being caught off guard. I'm actually aligning with what I already know about myself. And so I, you know, I keep driving that into self-knowledge makes us rock solid so that whatever happens on the external, we have methods, we have practices, we have um, procedures, we have um, ways within ourselves to address things. Mm. Yeah. And I think we did it both did it such a great job of, you know, exploring how, how this landed with us and what to do with it. Oh, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You are welcome. So, so let's just say goodbye to everybody and you stay online and I'll be right there to second. <laughs>